Good evening and welcome to Thursday Night Knives. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Joining me tonight to tackle some of the knife world's most pressing issues is frequent commenter, uh, Spirited Whiskey. Hey, hey everybody. Good just evening. in time. How are you, sir? Living the dream. Got a Excellent. little mezcal in hand and good to go. It's uh, it's it's a little uh, off type, I would expect, whiskey. Hello, a therapeutic edge. Good to see you, sir. Well, okay, spirited whiskey. I have whiskey. Salud. Have a good. I've got uh, whiskey here too, but I figure I'll start <laughs> with mezcal. So, mm. cheers. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about a few new knife drops. We're going to talk about what's new in our own collections or uh, what we're after. And then I also want to talk about two things in particular. Uh, one, I want to talk about the secondary market, uh, where you buy and sell. You in particular, I, I would imagine you do quite a bit of that. But where you buy and sell uh, your knives on the secondary market. And then also, um, I also want to talk about the USA uh, made only knife position. Uh, that is sort of... Um, yeah, that's a hot topic. Hardened. And uh, I'm just curious uh, how people feel, because uh, this is uh, something I've thought about myself, how people who take that position feel about, uh, good to see you, sir, how they feel about um, USA companies that are manufacturing outside of the country as well as inside the country. Matthew, good to see you, sir. Hey, Matthew. So, yeah, uh, we're going to have that, and it'll be uh, open open topics of conversation, but I would like people uh, to to start thinking about that, about secondary market, where you go. I'm a blade forums guy, but, uh, and I used to go to the USN, but I need to, I need to expand back out or I need a few new avenues, I think, or maybe I don't, maybe that's the problem. Sure. Maybe I need to stay away. So, uh, you do not need to stay away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess not. I guess not. Yeah. So before we get into the knife drops, I just want to uh, talk about a couple of things. First of all, um, everyone knows about knife rights. I just talked to Doug Ritter again. He's going to be coming up on the Sunday podcast, uh, week after next, I believe, or, or maybe it's this week. I, I can't remember. And, uh, we, we talk all about, uh, knife rights in the age of the pandemic and, uh, well, just knife rights and, and uh, the progress they've made and that kind of thing. And uh, we talked a lot about the Ultimate Steel, which is their annual fundraising uh, promo. So I just wanted to remind everyone that they just started uh, this, this campaign. It's an annual campaign and every year, uh, knife companies and knife makers and, uh, and others uh, make huge generous donations of their work uh, to to act as prizes for uh, you know drawings for diff different levels of support for this uh, campaign to earn money for uh, knife rights so they can go state by state and uh, get rid of these antiquated knife knife laws. Uh, uh, Spirit of whiskey, are you a member of knife rights? Um, yeah, I am. Um, look, I think it's incredibly important. Just like if you're a, a Second Amendment advocate, if you're um, a supporter of our rights and our freedoms. Um, this is an organization that really, they are at the forefront and always have been at the forefront of our rights to being able to um, to carry certain knives in jurisdictions that are typically difficult. Um, I'll use a really great example of a, of a huge victory uh, because of knife rights. Um, and that was here in Chicago, um, you know, where, where I'm at. And, um, and just gosh, maybe not even two years ago, um, we were not able to carry or own uh, automatic knives in any capacity. Um, and they were able to turn that law over um, a bit um, and allow those folks here in Illinois who carry a concealed carry, uh, sorry, a FOID card. There are two different things here in Illinois. Mm. We have a firearms owner's identification card Okay. Um, which permits you to own or purchase a firearm. Um, and with that card, you are now permitted to carry as well as own automatics. Oh, that's great. Um, so that's a really, a really nice thing. Um, so you obey the law, they do a background check, you get your FOID card. Of course, the process takes longer than you'd typically like, just based on government policies and everything else and hoops. Um, and then you could get your concealed carry on top of that. Right, but you have to have a FOID card, and then you can get automatic knives. That did not exist without knife rights. Uh, so, you know, they uh, 
they're an incredible organization. And if you're a knife advocate in any way, shape or form or a firearms advocate for that matter, um, you should be a, a member as well. Yeah. I mean, Chicago, that, that, it's a great example. Spyderco even made a ridiculously small knife called the Chicago, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. In just a matter of uh, a few years, they were able to turn that around. And, uh, you know, I know they, uh, they experienced frustration, like in my state of Virginia, uh, they've been kind of foiled at every turn, uh, to get, uh, to get automatic knives legalized for carry here. And, uh, yeah, but he's 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 just gonna keep coming back. That's a great thing too, is he just keeps com coming back. Something I just wanted to mention is that we're gonna be doing a an Instagram auction one week from today, uh, Thursday, uh, May fourteenth, from ten a.m. to ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Instagram only, and uh, uh, it's going to be uh, two things. One of them is a an, an Emerson Super CQC seven that was donated. Uh, during the uh, town hall uh, by Stone and Steel. And then uh, also we have a, a three things uh, in one lot donated by B Bob Terzawola during the same event uh, of his new book, uh, his compact tactical folder that was uh, released by Drop and made by We, and then this beautifully milled, very intricate um, uh, Guatemalan dragon's head. I think that's his logo. Uh, I mean, I know it's his logo, but I think that's a yeah. Guatemalan dragon. Um, he was a jade carver. Yeah. So was, a, was a, a Guatemala jade carver before he was a knife maker. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how, you know, his roots came from basically doing that fine artistic work of carving jade. And so he created, um, and I think he had, I think they're probably out now on their website, but he had some for sale on his website too. And they're bottle openers that are mm -hmm. incredibly intricate and they yeah. look like jade carvings. So it's, it's cool. Bob's that's awesome. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And it's titanium and it's, it's anodized, this beautiful green. It almost looks like jade, except it's yeah. obviously not. So uh, everyone should, uh, if you're interested, uh, come to the Instagram auction. I will have uh, the, the rules up shortly, uh, but it, I, I do know it will be uh, uh, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It will be closing out right as we start this show next week. And then uh, uh, if I have my wits about me, I will... Uh, well, I'll be able to announce the winner right there. So, so there you go. Knife rights. That's, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I have to say that all the proceeds of the, of this auction, that's the whole reason I bring it up is going to knife rights. It's going to be uh, this, this uh, podcast. That's awesome. Uh, one of our contributions. It's, it, it, I, I had to, I, I keep joking about it, but when they were uh, pledged to me on the show, I really wanted that CQC seven, but I was like, "All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll auction that off," <laughs> you know. And it's just been sitting over there mocking me for for a week and a half now. So I'm yeah. going to move this out next week. That's awesome. Good, good on you guys. Um, seriously, I, I think more people involved in the community um, that are in the forefront um, that are doing reviews and podcasts and so on that. Uh, have relationships with folks that wind up donating knives to their channel and stuff. Giveaways and stuff are great, but I think what you're doing is really cool um, because it, it goes further than just giving something away and creating a fan out of one person. You're you're helping impact a lot more by way of giving it to an organization that's doing good stuff. So, oh. Oh, thank you, thank you. That that uh, that makes it feel really good. <laughs> you, go. uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. It was uh, the cool thing is that they donated the things in the first place because yep. neither of those are inexpensive items. So I appreciate it. So uh, I wanted to talk for a second about. Okay, so you're you're a man who collects. Uh, how, how would you characterize your collection before we get into these knife drops? How would you <laughs> characterize your collection and and uh, and what you look for and what you uh, buy? You know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm the type of collector or have become the type of collector that, you know, I used to have a whole bunch of stuff uh, you know, in the hundreds, right, of whether it's spider codes and bench maids and, and so on and so forth and experiencing all the models and uh, and wanted to see what all these different designers were like in and, and, and a somewhat affordable way to do it. Then I realized, um, you know, I really wasn't using many of them while they were sitting there. So over time, I really become someone who, um, if if something really just sits and is a safe queen, that, that term safe queen, mm -hmm. if it just sits there, it winds up leaving my collection at some point. Um, you know, I, I'm like, eh, it's cool, but 
I never pocket it, I never carry it, so it's gonna wind up getting sold on the secondary market um, in some way. Um, so, but I also am the kind of guy that wants to experience everybody's work because I like to see what everybody's capable of and what the industry trends are, what people are doing, how they're doing it differently. Each maker kind of has their stamp and what their stamp is can change yeah. um, you know, from maker to maker. So what we you know, one it could be have to do with their lock interfacing and their lockup. And um, another person could be an expert at lock bar cutouts and, and, and relief cuts. And that's like, that's their forte. And another one's forte could be, oh my God, epic grinds right their grinds are spectacular they're super even they're really high quality grind work um another maker could be all about the the um aesthetic the the aesthetic of the handle scales or the usage of certain materials some makers are into natural materials and some makers are into uh, synthetic materials so for me i like to experience a little bit of everything and if i see something new i'm like gotta check it out I got to check it out. And uh, so I want to try it. If it doesn't like wow me to the point where I'm like, this fires on more cylinders than just the one mm -hmm. thing. And, 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 you know, if this is the whole package, it'll stick around. But generally I only have, I try and cap my hobby because mm -hmm. otherwise it would go nuts. And my wife would, <laughs> well, you so, know. Well, so where do you, where do you cap it? How many? Um, at any time, kind of I probably have no more than in the, about 25 to 30. 25 to 30 and they're all, uh, so you've gotten rid of all the spider co's and bench maids and are they all are they so, all uh the higher end uh kind of uh, stuff yeah at, th at this point um i i don't think i think i have i'm trying to think of how many productions i have maybe five or six that are production out of out of that and the rest are, are customs okay all right that's what i that's that's the impression i got from your instagram feed and from seeing you the other uh last week so so real steel knives and poltergeist uh on their poltergeist work knives is offering what they're calling custom options you know so yep. you're going to be able to get different materials and uh and uh so to you a a um a connoisseur of custom knives and and getting things exactly how you want them. What do you think of a company doing this with a much lower end uh, kind of production? I think it's awesome. I think um, it actually gives people a, a closer touch point to the custom knife market, actually, um, or to the roots of where the the origins of where that design came from. Mm -hmm. And the makers, you know, you like to use different materials, play around with different handle scale options blade finishes, blade steels, um, you name it. And this is a way that people can experience what that's like without having to spend the kind of money that's necessary to buy custom after custom and may like decide I'm not really into that finish. This way you don't have to break the bank and try out a whole bunch of different stuff. And I'm all, I'm all for it. Yeah, I I, uh, I think it's a, a really great, <laughs> is a safe queen specifically a knife term? Nah. Uh, yeah, I, I've I've only ever heard it. That's where I've heard it from. But I, in other collect collecting, I could imagine having a safe queen gun that you never want to take out. Yeah. Anything you, know. you carry on your person that you know, typically like people in the flashlight community, there's plenty of people that don't carry their flashlights and, and <laughs> safe queens. There are uh, pens. People collect pens, and a lot of yeah. pens can be that way. Knives, of course. Firearms, of course. Yeah. Um, but Anything you would carry on your person that could get damaged in any way. So yeah. some, some people, it's cars, automobiles. They will never drive the damn things. They stay in a garage, so they stay minty. Well, well lately, care. lately that's been me, and uh, you know, I've been keeping my Honda Pilot in amazing mint condition because I'm not driving anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's getting three weeks to the gallon. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, man. <laughs> Yeah, I I think it's cool too, and and um, to me, Poltergeist Works has uh, we, we you know we've mentioned this a lot of times on this show has a very uh, specific look. They have mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of style cues that you can, but but to have to have it dressed up a bit like the uh, the main picture that they have on uh, on Knife News uh, that brought my attention to this, like it it's it's not overdone to me. Too many patterns, too many conflicting uh, patterned materials is too much. This is just kind of a tasteful taste you know yeah. yeah totally and i'm a guy that you know, for me this aesthetic is really cool for some people like fancy stuff mm -hmm. right you have 
you know, that like the Timascus and then, then the, the Damast, in this case, Damast steel mm -hmm. blades. And, and, you know, there's a dressed up version of it, which is really fun for a, you know, for a Saturday, you know, Saturday night out or Sunday at church or synagogue or if you're me or, or whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, it's cool that you can do that with a poltergeist and you can also make it a simple user with simple aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for some, um, you know, our, our good friend, Alex, who everything he gets, even if he gets a production knife, like, a, you know, he's gotten a number of hinderers recently yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and an Emerson here and there. And he always dresses it up a little bit afterward. You know, he yeah. makes it his own. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I like that. Who's this new guy? <laughs> hey, who's the new guy? Hey, Levi. <laughs> uh, you, if for anybody who's interested too, you can also, um, I'm, my name is Ryan. I'm happy to say that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, you can follow me on Instagram at uh, at Spirited Blades um, is my knife related uh, and firearms related Instagram feed. And then at Spirited Whiskey is uh, is what I do in whether it's family life or whether it's my line of work. I'm in the I'm in the whiskey and spirits business. Um, you can see my mezcal hat, for instance. Um, so I've been in, in, you know, booze distribution forever. So I do a lot of that kind of stuff when I travel, go to distilleries and take pictures and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and I'm blending. I do a lot of whiskey and um, mezcal blending, you know, that I help a lot of distilleries with and, and all kinds of stuff like that. So there's more of that over there. But I'm a knife, I'm a knife nut. I'm a knife junkie. And so that's why I'm I'm here, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so Dave, uh, I'm interested in so many of the unique budget blades from Real Steel, Kubi, CRJB, Civivi, Rike, etc. Or um, Rake, sorry. <laughs> custom seldom get carried. Yeah, uh, custom seldom get carried. I'm on board with Spirited Whiskey. Yeah, uh, like uh, the new CJ CJRB that uh, that I know that you just recently got, Dave. Uh, after after I sang its praises, um, it is. Uh, you know, that is a, a, a great $30 knife. I could, I could really see that in a, in a, you know, titanium version or in a dressed up version, just that same, uh, the Tala, that same design. Um, you know, they're making some, some great stuff. So yeah, you, you take a great design like Dave is saying, and you dress it up a little bit and, and you still get to have, like you said, that church knife, that synagogue knife, but uh, you're not so worried that, you know, uh, you're you're going to get thrown onto the street if you lose it. For me, my collection, um, oh, nice. you know, I'm not so, uh, I'm not, how do I put it? I take care of my stuff. I treat it well, right? But I want something that's going to be usable and function really well. So things that aren't that wind up leaving my collection. I don't actually have really any, like Alex I know has some badass um you know moku mokume and you know all these fancy you know materials mm -hmm. at this point i think i only have one damascus blade in my collection believe it or not hmm. so and it's the manundi i manundi i carried at my wedding you know the, the, the rest of it is stuff that um they're customs and they're awesome and yes they're expensive but they're they're you know they're things that i carry and i use um really for the most part um but you know talking about a custom maker, right? I was talking about Tom Mayo, I think, a little bit um, on the last feed. Yep. But this is a Tom Mayo and Wingman EDC design. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it. Tom must have taught them how to do their their satin finish because the hand satin on is incredible. But it, this is one of the very few Chinese-made manufactured knives. It's done by Riot. And I'll tell you, it's the I think it's the best thing that Riot's ever done. I mean, the thing just for a lightweight blade – and it's got the kickstop flipper mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. There's the flipper. Yeah. No flipper. That's so cool. So it kind of disappears. That's Lee Williams uh, yeah. innovation. Yeah, that's a Lee Williams design, but it's implemented through this collab with Riot and Mayo. It's and cool. Tom Mayo. That is cool. I, I like I like the sort of um, well, this is gonna be the wrong term. So maybe help me with the term, but I like the sort of open source uh, nature of knife of knives these days there are a lot of uh yeah uh, open source sounds like there's a lot of taking and stuff but what i mean more is like sharing this, uh, yeah sharing and a lot of collaborating you know because yes. there's so much respect and uh you know uh I, I think through collaboration is where everyone's well 
maybe not everyone's, but that's where a lot of great work comes from. I know all the all the best stuff I ever do is through collaboration because yeah, someone has I mean, a great idea. Yeah, someone has a great idea, and they keep it to themselves. Yeah. you know how it's, far does that reach go? Yeah, um, I'm, 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 community at large. You know, if you share it among the community of makers, everybody gets better. Everybody does better stuff. You know, impact yeah. everyone. Yeah, see how this mechanism works on this kind of knife and this person, and yeah. then it's manufactured. I'm too nervous to really use an expensive knife. I like about the seventy to one hundred dollar range for carry. That's that is reasonable. Sure. Yes, it is. Um, uh, to me, there are a lot of really great knives in that. In that, I mean, that is a, that is a range. I, I guess you could say that about all ranges. But to to me, that is a range that that offers um, what do you call it? That sort of option paralysis it's like there's so many great things you can get now in yeah. that price range on bearings with great action or not on bearings uh, you know what whatever you want in that range so yeah that's he's well, been crushing it in that range crushing yes, it. yes right. they have so uh what do you what do you think of the civivis i think they're they're excellent um that being said it, it could segue us right into that u.s uh us china debate uh, kind of thing in the knife community that's been blowing up but um as a one of our topics but i think uh riyadh for one and and we civivi have been just slapping the competition around for some time in terms yeah. of um, price point and and quality uh, what you get out of the box is incredibly the grinds are good the edges are good the fit and finish is great the I mean, you know, it's yeah. they're, they're tough to beat in their price point. I have a uh, my sweet spot is at the two hundred mark for daily carry. After that, yes, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, or that's like most of the daily carry, and then you have a few that are over that for you know special days. Yeah, that's that's about kind of the to me because to me two hundred is like a very comfortable range to walk around in. Like, like all of my ZTs, I very, I feel very comfortable carrying and and then actually using and and if if need be, uh, on the rare occasion that that happens, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something over a you know cutting a sandwich or something. Yeah, I I feel totally uh, I t I feel totally fine with that. Um, but uh, don't forget oh, about okay. Tucson. Yeah. Dave keeps talking about Tucson and sure he just sent me an I've email. Heard great. What's up? I've heard they're great from like Neves, from the Neves that I'm friends with and stuff. Yeah. They just adore those things. Um, yeah. I haven't had my hands on them, so I can't really speak to it myself, but I've heard great things. Me neither. Uh, Dave, uh, who just commented, sent me a picture of some of his. And uh, what I like is I was, one of them was a Karambit, and, and it was a, a collaboration with Tepe Design. So they're starting to do yep. uh, collaborations with designers, which I always like uh, con you know, conceptually. I like the idea that you can get a designer's work and, and you know, like, uh, like I can have a Boker Squale and never have to wait for a Charles Marlowe and try and pay for one. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, so I like that. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, but also, it seems like every knife I see is a different design from them. Like, it seems like they come out with a lot of limited batches. I I'm not sure how they work or anything about them. Uh, but I can't wait to get one in hand. Uh, Neve, uh, Jared said he was going to send one at some point for me to, you know, just try out. We're, we're going to do some sort of hostage they're people, exchange. They're great. They'll hook you up. Um, so I saw real quick going back, Jim said, how about a pocket check? So we oh, yeah, some of what people have in their pockets from chat. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what everybody's carrying. Oh, um, Jim, I did it again. I covered my chat with my own. Uh, okay, cool. I can uh, show you mine real quick while everybody pops theirs up if you want. Oh, let's yeah. See. Phil Hartsfield Sr. Three and a half inch Tonto A2 and a Spyderco Delicate. Great. Nice. A2 is excellent, serviceable, wonderful steel. It's been time tested and proven forever. And I mean, same thing goes for Delica. So that's an yeah. that's the air cooled A2. Yeah. That's a tool steel air cooled. Yeah, air cooled tool steel. <coughs> I remember thinking, oh, that's the. Mm. This is a brand new um, that I just got. the The tie lights. You can see it's got a red backup. This is barrel flashlights. Um, and this is all titanium. It's got black washed. It's mm -hmm. all black washed titanium with a 3D milled titanium stone wash clip. Very cool clip. Titanium ring on here. Um, and it's got triple Samsung LEDs that, with a red backup. 
So you showed a light from the same company, but with the uh, with the fighting uh, tiger. Mouth, uh, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, what's that? This I is love the pen. Uh, this is a Fellholter, oh, Brian Fellholter. Um, I upgraded to a 3D milled clip on it, but I've had this same pen and carried it most days the last five, four, four or five years. And it's got a, a Damascus end cap. I don't know if you can see yeah. that. That's beautiful. So what what kind of ink cartridge does that carry? And and this has a fidget spinner. Oh jeez! <laughs> the end drive everyone nuts. If if the clicking of it doesn't, you can spin that and really just. Get and it. you said ink cartridge. Um, this yeah. is standard Schmidt or um, you know, just a standard size, regular full size Schmidt cartridge. Okay. Um, or it comes with an adapter for your uh, space Fisher space pens, which I use. Okay. And then this arrived today. Oh God, that's what is that? So this is um, a new maker. Well, it's not a new maker. It's an actually it's an OG maker of South Africa. Um, so his name is Arno Bernard. Oh, and you probably know his fixed blades. That's but he did one. It's got a beautiful polish satin on the on the blade, machine satin flats, and then those are warthog tusk inlays. Oh God, that's beautiful! And I love uh, natural materials. Three D, you know, three D milled pocket clip. It's basically what what surprised me about this is it's got the action of a Koenig Arius. I mean, it's just this thing is incredible. Um, silky smooth, but the lockup. Solid as can be, great work knife. And if people are looking for something, honestly, that's in between like a high, high, high end production and getting into the custom realm, this was like, I mean, it's $700, so it's expensive. But yeah. among customs, that's a, that's a, a steal for what you're getting. Uh, very unusual blade and grind. Can you hold that up again? I mean, it's like a very high flat grind, right? And then it's polished and it's got that cool sort of it's got a bead uh a bead blasted nail nick right mm. and then machine satin flats and then a polished satin i mean you can see the reflection is yeah that is a wicked blade man that is a really cool looking blade and you can use your middle finger very very easily on the nail nick which is nice to deploy it with a spidey flick it's yeah fun. And the warthog tusk, what's the how does it feel? Is it polished or does it have any sort of grip to it? Or no, um, no, it's polished and it's it's silky. Um, it very is it's very reminiscent of a Chris Reeve inlay. If you if you've ever experienced Chris Reeve inlay works, the, he mills pockets and then they're they're glued in basically into those pockets. But there's I mean the tolerance that he does the inlay is spectacular. So, so I'm very, 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 very impressed. How, how uh, frequently, uh, if you could average, how frequently would you say you're, you have a new knife? Uh, how long do you spend with a new knife before something else usurps it and yeah. you're carrying that new thing? It depends on what it is. Um, some, you know, some have stuck around for many, many years. Um, others stick around for a week, two weeks, you know, and, and then turn stuff over. Because I may get, you know, a knife a week maybe or every two or every three. It just, it just depends on if I find something I fall in love with, if I'm able to move some other stuff that I'm not as in love with and the rotation continues. It's worked out for me though. All it's right. You check. We're, we're going to find out how you can stay so fluid with the buying and selling. But before we do, I want to ask Justin, what is it about the Tucson? You said uh, you just got this Tucson TS 190 and it's amazing. What is it? Uh, let us know. ZT00095 tan black S90V. That's a fabulous choice. S90V is incredible steel. What's 0095? What is that model? I can't think of that. I can't. Uh, well, I have this Google later in front of me. But uh, as ZT makes a fine daily carry. Is it by Rexford? Oh, yes. Yes. It's the Rexford that. Uh, Yes, it's cool. It, it looks like the one that they were making only in Russia for a while, or maybe oh, it is yeah, the night yeah. they're only making in Russia for a while. Almost daily carry. Yeah, okay. Tan and black. Nice. Code steel, code four. Excellent. Nice. Excellent excellent choice. Uh, I used to have the, the drop point. I got rid of it because I was going to get the Tanto. I was going through a Tanto phase, and then I never ended up picking it up. But, uh, um, yeah, I uh, real steel, Sidis. 
WMK exclusive. Oh, blue glow. I don't know what the Sidis is. Never heard of it. I will I will look that one up too, but it's real oh. steel and they are they are doing some cool stuff, like we said with the customers. Yeah. yeah. That, oh that cool. 51 I showed you last week. Yeah. Um that I got was a very limited run. And um so I actually speaking of how I can move some things, certain things get raffled on Instagram. So that okay. one was uh, won by Levi in a raffle on Instagram. He's part of Alex and the, the same chat group that myself and Alex and a whole bunch of great knife nuts are in. But yeah. uh, I did it because I had this coming. Oh, oh so, I got you. So that's basically, you know, that's part of my philosophy, right? In out. If, if, if I want something and something of, of eh, dependent on value, yeah, higher could be lower, but yeah. Well, you don't want to be a total glutton. So uh, let Colby know what that pen is again. Fellholter. Um, yeah, this pen is a Brian Fellholter, and it's called the Tie Bolt, and it's called a Tie Bolt due to this action, and it's it's just awesome. It's a fun 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 to fidget with. That opens and closes that way. They have all different milling designs. This is the like the OG. That's very, very simple and very clean. Um, and then this on the end is called a fab cap. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Fab cap. So, um, and those come in plain stone wash. They don't really make them anymore. So there's oh. a super high secondary market value. Really? Yeah. Like for a fidget spinner. No, I know it's for not that. the top of a pen. I mean, these things, the Damascus one's probably secondary for three, four hundred dollars. Wow. And well, we all know that's not probably coming back. So you know, that's kind of a cool little bit of history. Edwin, good to see you, sir. Carrying a custom. Oh, oh you see 15 custom. Sweet. Jeez. Oh, oh, and he's been carrying these Williams uh, fixed blades. Are you familiar with those? Uh, you know, um, uh, blade. Shobu um, Zukuri. Oh, what's his first name now? I'm spacing on his first name. Uh, Williams, he, <laughs> you know, uh, he he designed the um, Williams, James and Chris. Yes, James Williams, yeah, famed uh, Japanese martial arts uh, bladed expert, and he's designed uh, all, he designed all those big uh, CRKT, uh, the Obaki, and all those knives, A lot of Quakens and the like. Yes, yes. Well, well, they now have their own um, outfit, and and they're cool. um, making uh, making uh, you know. I'm oh, only yeah. Out. Yeah, this is this is awesome. I oh, need okay. to do this because this is this is cool. The only um, Japanese style ones that I've ever ever fallen in love with are by Sebastian Borcha, uh, Borka. Oh, blades. Yeah, but he charges such. I mean, deservedly, right? He's an incredible grinder, an incredible craftsman. But I mean, his uh, his you know hand wrapped um, uh, Japanese style knives are incredible yeah. but like even the cyrus he did with bastinelli was like a thousand dollars oh my god yeah he he has one that that uh i watched him sort of painstakingly uh um sort of design it's a double-edged uh it's a yeah, double-edged it's leaf shape john yeah just beautiful stuff medford all day john yeah, right yeah, medford is doing great work so i wanted to uh uh, update, give everyone, because I know everyone's just dying to know, and they're all wondering about my uh, Praetorian, and it's finally uh, at, at the, can open it up one-handed phase. I still have to assist with my back fingers, but I don't care. <laughs> it's so smooth, and it's it's yeah. been through sort of wor obsessive worrying over it, you know? Uh, just worrying it open and closed, and it's just, man, it's smoothed itself out. Uh, it always felt smooth, but it was very, very tight. And, uh, you know, this is only my second Medford uh, that I've owned and that I've ever had in hand. And very impressed with with. I had one of the new Strider Medford collabs. Hmm. Um, not did you know that Strider was collaborating with Medford for some of their work? Uh, it was a big old to do um, in the Strider forum, but no necessarily great reason, in my opinion. But at any rate, um, Strider uh, Medford is helping Strider produce in their factory to help oh. their demand a bit um, on a couple of models, not everything. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they released a, a re release of the AR, uh, the AR 75, which is a three quarter version of the full size AR. Um, and I had one of those um, uh, that I bought off the secondary market and it was terrific. 
Yeah. Um, the detent was a bit strong and just like other Medfords, you've got, you know, to work the lock bar, you sometimes have to use two hands for a while. Um, you know, but they're, they're tanks. It turns you into more of a man, a That's better correct. man. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, only true custom I have is a Neil shoot eight inch dagger. Oof. That sounds beautiful. Shoot. I've, I think I've heard his name, uh, but uh, you know, custom eight inch dagger. I, I love it. Sight unseen pretty much. My most expensive Phil Hartsfield Senior Custom, nine and a half inch Tanto Triple Tenter uh, Tempered A2, nine hundred bucks in cool. 1986. Wow, he passed away in 2010. All right, wow. So that's you know you bring up a really cool topic, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but one of the things that um, one of the reasons I want to try so many different things and have so many things through my hands, a is because it's fun. Yeah. B is because there's so many great people in the community. Um, I don't know if uh, if Matt Christensen popped in here yet or not, um, but he said I was talking to him earlier. He's going to be doing a build for me for um, if you know CK Knives uh, or Christensen Custom Knives. He does unbelievable work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's going to do a build for me coming up. And I was just chatting with him about it a little bit today. And he had an auction piece up today. Oh and God! He, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's you the- see it? With the uh, Westinghouse micarta and the, and the underlay, yes, uh, Damascus with the holes in the Westie, so you so, can see that Damascus come through. Oh, spot! I mean, spot on. Okay, so so let me just say, I'm sorry. Before you continue, like to me, that is that is like a really a beautifully restrained use of those materials. Where yeah. to to my eye, when you get too many of those, uh, you get the Mister Furley issues and too many conflicting patterns. At the way he did that in that auction knife. Yeah. Is mm. and someone paid for it. I, I don't know what it's up to now, but I think it was close oh. to thirty five hundred dollars. So. Wow! Well, I'm sure it's but, worth every penny. You know, but what I was going to say is that there's so many great people in this community, and there's so many great makers with so much, so talented, and it's so talented. Um, and Matt uh, Matthew Christensen is absolutely among them, and uh, and so anyway, but that's an, that's a reason that keep wanting new things and trying new things. And, you know, I had Jens Anso just build one for me that just arrived. Um, wow. And, um, is it close at hand? I have my, yeah, I have my box next to me here. Nice. Oh God. So that's the one that ZT did a production version. No, of. no, this is, this is the haddock. Haddock is the model. on God, the, that is the, beautiful. 3.6 inch blade thereabouts. Um, and it's a nail nick opener. You can actually, I can front flip it. So, and next to, let me see, I got the slippy or the double detent one from him. So you can see the size, but I kind of got it to me. See if I can get this. Wow. So you can kind of see there's a, there's a hefty size difference between these. So, so how, how long does it take to get a knife from Yenzanzo? Anzo? nested liner lock in this thing. god look at that that is just Beautiful. nested yeah. nested liners titanium liners oh. and black micarta he did good he did a great job so that auction knife sold for 37.50 so, uh, uh, i'm sorry who, uh, jim who saw that so, yeah someone was just uh oh levi Ooh. levi's letting us know 37.50 yeah baby good for him so, uh, like I was saying, uh, with uh, with Jens Anzo, for instance, do yeah. you have to get on his books and then you just wait and wait and wait and kind of talk back and forth and, oh, yeah. coming up next month, I'm going to start your knife? Is it that kind of thing? So, Jens, if you go on his website, he's got a terrific website, and um, it'll say if he's making any models right now or taking mm-hmm. any orders on certain models. But what I think he likes to do to keep it fresh uh, for him is he'll, like, do uh, – he'll focus on, like, two different – models at a time and be like, okay, everyone who wants one, you know, pay me a $500 deposit. The rest will be due on the completion. He touches base with you. Unbelievably great communicator. Um, he's on the ball. I mean, on the ball and he gives you a time window. He sticks to it. It's usually about three to four, three months, three, four months. It's not bad. Wow. Turn around um, and uh, give him your specs. You tell him what you like, uh, you know, what you want on that particular model. And then while he's doing that, he's kind of models or making some tweaks. (laughs) And then then when he's, and then eventually he'll cut off, you know, like he cut off the Monte Carlo, right. Mm -hmm. He wants to tweak some stuff. 
uh, <laughs> to the design and I'll start doing something else. But go on the website. Um, fascinatingly enough, he's, I think, available to do some haddocks and some orsos right now. Oh, wow. Uh, the orso, is that a, uh, is that a folder, a um, uh, flipper? Orso is his smaller flipper. Yep. The Neo yeah. is his larger flipper. Orso is his smaller flipper. The haddock is basically a nail nick, but you can open it with a thumb roll or mm -hmm. I've actually been able to front flip it, uh, which is fun, but they're all about, they start at like not cheap. His work starts at about $1,300. Better get three. Hey, uh, Jim, what did you have up before, uh, before blade banner was the price point? Uh, Barry, uh, uh, we Roxy four Dave. We'll talk offline. Uh, great knife. We'll talk offline. I might yeah. have a. I might have a line on one of those. Um, uh, I, I I call that my uh, my space age Viking tactical folder. It looks like it looks like an old old school sax, but just kind of updated to to the space age. A Mike. neat neo build, Mike. Sweet. What's a limited neo? Oh, okay, his neo. Okay. Which, um, it's basically a, a Neo is another one of his models. It's the slightly larger version of his Orso, but it's a it's a it's a flipper as well. Man, I mean, his work is seamless, and I like how there's a lot of makers that use that do a lot of custom work on their stuff that makes it feel custom, mm -hmm. and that but still use modern engineering to do some other stuff. And I, I like that kind of those two things meeting like so for me you know um as cool as a koenig arius is or a holt specter or you know some of those kind of things the the cnc mastery for me doesn't feel handmade enough mm -hmm. which is i know it's goofy they're too perfect um in a lot of ways um for me so i like when um something is made by hand but yet excellent quality but you still feel the handmade nature of it and and uh do you like um do you like the uh, uh, contrast of modern materials with uh, natural materials like mammoth ivory and next to titanium? I mean, to me, those kind of things, like when you mix the the modern yeah. materials and the and the uh, traditional materials together. I like when stuff patinas, uh, you mm -hmm. know, yes, 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 yes. traditional brass and copper. Um, I would choose zirconium over Timascus. I would choose, you know, natural micarta or micarta over carbon fiber. Right. Um, yes, me too. And, and I would probably, yeah, I love, my, I love old school materials. Um, I love wood inlay. I love the the warthog tusk that I just got is really cool. There's just there's something naturally beautiful about it. Yeah, you have to take care of it maybe a little bit more, you know, in in some ways. But a lot of the stuff's darn tough, like mm -hmm. you know, tougher than you think. So. Well, so I, I want to get to the, uh, I want to get to, this is a, a, a part of the Apex pass around. Yeah. Yeah. Apex, you should be if you're not. Apex, yes, I, I would. But I don't have a YouTube channel. Uh -uh. But, um, for YouTubers, do you know what it is? Bob? No, I don't. So I don't. like Metal Complex and Zach Stuff and Slicey Dicey and all those guys who you have on here, Stasa. They're all part of this group on YouTube that pass stuff between each other so they can experience it, review it, and pass it on. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Definitely would love to be a part of that, get my hands on some of these things. Uh, it, so, uh, Blade Banter, uh, perhaps we can talk offline about that, too. I'd be very interested in checking that out. I, I don't want to I don't want to be an extra person throwing in a, a, a week's-long delay to someone getting that knife, but uh, I guess I'll go on to the end. But... Uh, I really wanted to get to the secondary market with you because um, I, I, I do, uh, I'm pretty much on blade forums uh, on occasion. I'll try a sales video on YouTube. Never goes well for me. I don't have a huge, yeah. uh, you know, it's, I think you have to do that with some regularity and, uh, and have a bigger audience and like love them and, lives every Thursday. He does a thing, right? And yeah. Yeah. And, um, of people's stuff. The secondary market's an interesting thing. I've been around it forever. I feel like uh, uh -huh. um, I've probably been on blade forums for twelve years. I, I would get oh, wow. a long time. Um, and uh, luckily, I, I've I've never had issues for anybody I've dealt with on blade forums. Um, you know, their rating program that they use it, it seems to be good. Um, you know, I I ask for people's feedback. They give feedback. I give people feedback, and that system does work. Um, yeah. 
So that's a decent form. The only problem with it is it's less active now that social media has come to life, right? So there's, I just think less people posting, less new people getting involved. It, people my age or your age, maybe on Blade Forums. Um, you know, a lot of the knife community thinks of us as the grandpas, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, um, you know, everybody's using Instagram um, and face, uh, Facebook groups, of course. Um, as well as Reddit, right? So there's a combination of things. I've found that there are pluses and minuses to each, right? So um, Blade Forum has a specific buyer. For instance, a lot of Chris Reeve guys are on there. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone sell Chris Reeve knife. You want to do it on Blade Forums, right? That's you know. So there's a same thing with like the Bussy fans, right? Like that's yeah, they have sub forums in the exist. Yeah, um, on Instagram. Um, I do, I, I have a, a large group that of, of us that are friends that banter all day long about <laughs> knives and, and, and pens and flashlights and chicks and whatever the heck but at any rate. Um, so that, that group, um, is, um, fun because it continues to grow and they have friends. And so you create this network of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having a network and building the network of people that you know are good people in the community that are never going to double cross you, that meet, do what they're going to say they're going to do. There's no scammers. Everybody knows everybody. And it's just a tight knit community. It's, it's a small community to begin with. So yeah. on Instagram, um, yeah, that seems to work really well. And then raffles are fun on there. So you can have some fun with, uh, with raffles. That's my spirited whiskey account. Yeah. So that's kind of life and whiskey and there's some knives on there, but if you go to my spirited at spirited blades, it'll probably be a much better, um, a much better look, Jim. But, um, so the community there's good and raffling. I don't host my own raffles. I'm just, I don't have the time and yeah. I'm not that great at it, but, um, a number of guys like, um, Lou long Island knife guy does great job. Uh, Epic Horror is another one. My buddy, Derek, uh, knife to meet you. Um, uh, is also terrific um, about running raffles. The only thing with raffles is you just have to be cognizant of pricing, um, you know, to where are you going to get, uh, you know, are they overpriced? Are they priced fairly? Because yeah. a lot of people will try and, you know, and negate their cost of, of the transaction by doing it. Yeah. There's, there's some of my, my feed there on Instagram. So. Wow, man. What a collection. Jeez. There's a lot of cool stuff that goes through, that goes through my hands and in my knife box. So. So uh, Facebook groups is another way. Um, and, oh. you know, so Strider has a Facebook group. Chris Reeve has a Facebook group. Pena, you know, if you like Enrique Pena stuff, he has a great Facebook group. Um, Tycoons, you know, as for TRM and you know, so on and so forth. And those are another great means. So um, I've had nothing but pretty much good, good things happen. I've had one snafu. Yeah, really in all the years, um, but the guy is a pretty well-known jerk and don't <laughs> talk bad about anybody on here, but um, you get it. Some of those people exist yeah. in the world. It is what it is. Yes, indeed. It is what it is. Uh, uh, go back uh, one, please, uh, Jim. Facebook dedicated groups and USN. Yeah, uh, I, I hear oh. Ed, Edwin uh, frequently in his uh, Emerson collection reviews. He's got an astounding Emerson collection. Uh, Frequently, he will he will mention how he got it through the the Facebook group and got the early tip off or or found a you know found someone who had something in particular there as opposed to out in the wider world and Instagram I forgot he said Levi Facebook is my favorite by far uh, use Instagram for raffles and following makers yeah if you're in yeah. the game you got to be on Instagram because all the custom makers will generally use Instagram as a primary means to selling their stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's the perfect visual medium for that. Hey, James, good to see you, sir. Uh, Reddit Blade yeah. Blade Forums, USN, IG Facebook groups. Uh, you know, I got a. I, the, it's the Facebook groups I have to get into. I've, I, I, it takes a while. I'm not Facebook friendly. I got to get there. I've used Facebook knife trading. Uh, okay, well, knife, knife gods. gods. I'm not. I'm not familiar That's with knife gods. That's a good group in in there. Um, but yeah, there's there's a ton of those. So. You know, right now it's an incredible uh, buyer's market. Anybody who has money, you have an opportunity. Um, unless you're looking for a whole Spectre V4, Tony. <laughs> but um, but outside outside of uh, the couple, there's always a couple hot items, hot ticket items yeah. that drive 
ridiculous secondary market value. And when I say ridiculous, I mean people that are trying to flip stuff and make a grand at a time, you know, uh, on on something. Um, and it's it's happening, like for sure. It's 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 a thing. It's been happening for a while, forever, forever, honestly. But um, if you're a buyer right now, you can find some pretty awesome stuff from people in the secondary market. Um, if you look and if you ask and if you get involved in Instagram communities, um, chat communities, and make some friends, and you know you can find pretty much whatever you want. Well, Jim is asking, uh, what is your approach to pricing uh, and trading? Also, yeah. how do you how do you figure out, uh, uh, and, and does that affect how you carry and use a knife? Are you sure. concerned about the resale value? Do you, uh, and then once you price it, how do you how do you figure out how to price a knife? Yep. So, pricing is uh, is interesting because. <laughs> You know, the secondary market value is one thing. Um, table values is another, especially when you're talking about custom work. Um, for productions, um, it's it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, some things just generally hold value better than others, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about like Chris Reeve, um, you know, those knives will hold their value pretty well. You might lose 20, 30 bucks um, mm -hmm. as long as you keep the condition pretty good. Um, by condition pretty good, I mean, you know, it's been carried once or twice. Maybe there's a snail trail or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, clip but otherwise and it's disclosed otherwise it's in good you know really good shape no scratches on the blade that kind of thing um if you disclose that stuff um and you know your price will probably drop if you disclose and if it's real um your price will probably drop you know 70 80 bucks 90 bucks depending on on a crk um but for spyrocos and the like i mean sprint runs are a whole nother animal and, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a whole market around sprint runs for spyderco um and what those are doing in raffles and, and on blade forums and stuff um you know so some are sought after and some are not and so you know you really have to kind of watch it closely and see what is happening in the market and pay kind of attention to what other people are listing at what other people are selling and not selling at to mm -hmm. realize what you might need to price something at um, but there are some that like certain makers like i know um of my peter resenti Python 2.0 that I just got. I'll show you that because it's fun. Ah. Um, oh, God, that's beautiful. I, I love his designs. God. This one has a hand peened. You see that copper color? Yeah. yeah. They like peened it. And I mean, it's just, it's super clean. The grind's incredibly, incre incredibly good. It's wicked thin behind the edge. Um, and yeah, he, he does awesome, awesome work. But anyway, I know that, you know, I got this from Peter directly, right? Um, and I was I was lucky to do so. But I also know that you know the secondary market value on this is probably a couple three hundred dollars higher than I probably paid for it. Hmm. Yeah, so it seems like uh, customs are way more dynamic uh, in terms of how how you might let it go. Uh, got to know your maker. Ask friends. Uh, that's when those chat communities really come in handy. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of guys will ping each other and say, you know, we'll talk about values of individual makers and stuff all, all day long. That's why we can chat so much, just because there's so many models that are are sought after right now. Like, for instance, right, Peter Resenti, of course, has been for a while pretty hot. Holt, of course, is pretty hot. So yeah. those are fetching really high secondary market. Jason Guthrie scouts are super hot, and those are fetching incredible dollars on the secondary market. And, they're, um, and then you're also seeing some that are coming down pretty quickly, like some Shirogorov custom divisions, because their productions are getting so good that the CD versions, the custom ones, are dropping in price. And so um, – Makers go in and out of favor. Um, you know, there's hmm. they are, I don't want to name drop too much, you know, but um sham worries were all the all the rage. And then yeah. people found out that Gareth Bull wasn't really very great to deal with personally or had problems yeah. with their customer service experience. That news spreads pretty quickly. And and then, you know, what once was, you know, those um only a month ago, um, you know, a 3.5 inch new Zerk. Uh, 3.5 inch Shamwari was two thousand dollars. Now they're down to probably, you know, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred. Whoa! You know, and uh, and and but table on those was nine fifty. In one month? Oh yeah, in one month. You're saying that? Well, in probably the last couple of months. I, okay, know. okay, okay. So it's recent. Well, it's additive, but recent yeah. developments or whatever. Yeah. 
but it's how that's how fast it can happen. Something can wow. get that hot. You know, all of a sudden people found out that Holt that Holt is no longer going to be making any more specters, right? That they're going to be producing their new uh, upcoming design, the haptic, which is basically looks like a specter pretty closely, um, but has a different clip and a different blade shape. It's a oh. short, but warny kind of shape instead of this, you know, classic drop point, straight back drop point. So because of that, those have gone haywire. <laughs> I mean, haywire. As if they weren't already, you know? Oh yeah. No, it, um, you used to be able to get like a, you know, a V3 on the secondary market table was like 750 bucks wow. and they, were, and secondary was probably $1,100, $1,200. And right now the V4s are 16 to 17, 16, 17, 1800. Well, uh, while, yeah. while we're, while we're kind of in this, this yeah. territory, in this territory, um, what do you think the the position is okay for the usa only knife yeah. cr crowd and i don't mean to that sounds kind of i don't mean it like that people who are buying us made knives over versus buying chinese made knives for, or for whom it's very important to to support yeah exactly um and take a, a strong position um what what is the deal with because because i've been reassessing my collection a bit and sure. before before any of this happened and and probably over the past year, I've been kind of going towards a, a more American collection uh, in general. But I was looking at my spider coast, for instance, and a few of them are made in America and a few of them are made in Taiwan. And one of them is made in Italy. And I'm like, how do people feel? You know, I'm a, I, I, my background is, is Italian and I'm yeah. you know, proud of that heritage. And, and there's some beautiful knives coming out of Italy. And I'm like, yeah. hmm, I wonder how I should feel about a spider co made in Italy as opposed and you know it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting. So where do you think uh, the purist on that position rests with an American company making some of their product overseas? Um, it's interesting, right? Because like I, we were just talking about the new Spiderco, or your notes were talking about the new Spiderco releases, which I'm yeah. sure we'll pass in a glimpse on the screen because they're pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them you like the Leo Jumbo, right? Um, yeah. I just pre-ordered one of the Martin Slish design swaybacks um from blade hq right so um the but i wanted i was looking and trying to figure out where the the slish was made where where the swayback was made i couldn't find it i realized based on past history that it's coming from their taichung you know factory yeah but um but i was really hoping that it came from the u.s factory and so there's a weird part of me that that of course always I also live my life as a, as I'm a patriot, right? Like I, I love where I live. I love the USA. I love USA made products. It doesn't mean I don't buy other stuff. Yeah. I try and make a point to keep, you know, the dollars that I earn here in the United States, here in the United States. Um, so the USA made stance, look, there's an unbelievable amount of great companies, great people and great makers that are making stuff here in the United States. I truly um try to make a point and the vast majority of my collection is from us makers um but that doesn't mean that i don't love a, a lot of my friends that are makers outside of the us in yeah. South africa um or wherever or canada or you know wherever the heck they they might reside because they're good people and i'm supporting a good family and, and good people that way too hmm. um, i only have one chinese production knife left in the arsenal and it's that wingman edc mddk that i showed you earlier from Rio, yeah. right um and honestly that's because I, i've just gotten to a point where i'd rather have the real thing and spend the money on an actual actual mayos <laughs> yeah yeah i hear yeah. that um so they're so more expensive in general so that's that's the downside right savini yeah. is making crazy good stuff yeah and yeah i mean but, i, I I'm sorry. I say, yeah, I, it, they're making better than I could for sure. And I, I just got my first Civivi uh, recently to, to sort of check out. And it's very impressive uh, um, in some ways. And in other ways, it just it just doesn't appeal uh, yeah. the way some of the other uh, less. Hey, Skywarp, uh, some of the less uh, other yeah, less sure expensive you know. knives. Uh, but could you go back to uh, oh, Blade Banter was mentioning uh, the topic of U.S. OEMs and this this comes up from time to time. And there are some there's Millet. And there's yeah. uh, Dauntless manufacturing, and yeah. and and there and uh, several others. Wow. And I, man, I would love. I, I've I've said this to a lot of makers that there is a huge business opportunity 
I'm in the I'm in the business of marketing booze, right? That's that's I try and figure out how to make a new whiskey, an emerging whiskey brand like a, a Whistle Pig or you know or MGP ingredients at Indiana. I'm trying to you know they make 85% of all rye in America, but they sell it to someone else, and now they have their own brand, and I have to market it and figure out how to make something new work and help consumers to figure out, Oh, why should I buy this off the shelf versus something I already know and I'm comfortable with. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a huge, I mean, huge opportunity for someone to pick up the slack here in the United States and actually create a true OEM manufacturer here in the U S that can do what people are doing like drop and so on. And, and everybody else that's using all this great intellectual property of our yeah. awesome makers. Yeah. And make them here in the United States. I, 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 God, I would implore, and and I'm sure money is is a major issue, right? And the cost of production is a major issue. But CRK does it. They're running a healthy business. It's successful here in the United States with a lot of employees, and they're doing really good stuff, right? So someone needs to open a shop like CRK or like right. Medford. Now Medford already do this. What you're talking mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. Like I said, they're working with Strider. They're probably going to start doing some other stuff. That, that they, he, Greg has built his facility up to be able to be the OEM for some stuff for that's, projects like that. I think that's a great idea. And uh, well, he's an enterprising guy by nature. So I think that's it. it be the first it, one that does it. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, hmm. Well, I was just going to say something evaporated just like that. But uh, it, it was about, oh, Millet. Millet knives started from a couple of guys who left Chris Reeve knives. So, uh, you know, they definitely uh, took some of the process. I mean, I, I really have no idea how much or what they took. The but ability, but if, stuff, yeah. yeah, if they're engineering for Chris Reeve knives, they, they started Millet with some know-how. That's for sure. I've approached brands and they're too busy with their own knives. Yeah. And no doubt uh, some of these brands, you if they were to do OEM work, like uh, say Benchmade used to do, uh, it would be uh, no doubt astronomically expensive. Um if they're not set up for that, you know, you, you, uh, I would imagine, uh, maybe, maybe collaboration is the way to go in terms of, uh, have, have uh, you guys heard of the, the, the guy named Keith, his name is Keith Eddick out of New York. Mm -mm, not sure. Um, Keith does collaborative mid tech work. Um, he has CNC machining and does a great job actually with his product. He's done some mid tech work for Peter Carey. Oh, nice. um, he's also done some mid tech work for Ed Cope um, with his project Venturist design. Um, so there are people out there that are, that are attempting to do it. I just don't know if, you know, if they have the capability, how business savvy they are. I, I don't, I don't know the intricacies. Are there scalability, the cost of labor and all that stuff. Exactly. But yeah. the commercial viability, I, I have to believe if done correctly is, is very much there and the opportunity is very much there. Um, so I hope Keith, you know, again, I, I hope some of these guys, Keith and Medford and a few others, um, someone needs to, I even had an idea where a co-op could exist. I think that would be awesome. Kind well, of like, uh, the, the, the kind of like the knife makers of Maniago thing. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Except here in the United States. Yeah. So in other words, you've got a whole bunch of great designers. They're all giving their stuff to, to drop and we to make why the hell not profit share and get together buy a, a, a big ass pool, pool the money, split the dividends, um, you know, and, and have someone else run it and create something terrific out of it. Um, well, I think this is your encore career. I think you're defining it right here. Perhaps. <laughs> I mean, that, cause really I, all jokes aside that, that would be great. That's what I was thinking kind of when you first started talking about this is that, um, you know, maybe it's not tenable for for uh, one company to take on that burden, or for w one company just to. So maybe maybe an alternating situation or some sort of collective, as you say. Yeah, yep. uh, I was talking. Um, I was mentioning Matt Christensen earlier, and I was talking to Matt Christensen about this topic a little while back. Um, and he had some knife maker insights that were interesting about it, right? Like you get all those different personalities together and it's, it's like having a whole bunch of master chefs in, in the same, <laughs> you know, and, but you know, my philosophy is this, right? If you have an outside entity actually running the business that doesn't, that's not one of the makers, mm -hmm. you can have a recipe for success if you build it the right way. Um, and the fact of the matter is this, right? 
you, I was mentioning makers who quickly can fall out of favor because of shitty. Sorry, I, I don't think I can do That's that. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize. Um, but crummy customer service, right? Um, one of which you know I, I mentioned already, uh, but there are a number of them, especially overseas, and they have all kinds of complications that they're trying to deal with to try and turn stuff around in a timely fashion, um, whether they're communicators or not. But most, of, I, I gotta say, most makers are like chefs. That's the best way I can, they're like the great master chefs. And most master chefs are not great restaurant owners. It's just, it's the nature of a thing. And, but they're great at what they do. Um, and a lot of makers are that way. Why not create a whole awesome test kitchen full of the best makers and have somebody there to run it, um, run the business appropriately. And um, everyone can be a profit sharer in it. Um, and it could be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think that's an outstanding idea. And I think there would be uh, plenty of people interested to hear yeah. more about that. Um, Let's go, Bob. And well, yeah, I mean, I, and and you sell it so well. And uh, yeah, I love that idea. And and it's time has come, you know, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, challenges and that kind of thing, you know, it, the mother of invention, all of that. Maybe, maybe this kind of adversity will bring some of that out because some people might need to get together to actually keep going. Lindy Lou, good to see you. Thanks for yeah, thanks. joining us. Hey, Sky Warp, how's it going? What's up? How's everybody doing? Hi, sp hi Spirit. Hey. Spirited Whiskey. Just figured I'd come by and say hello to Bob because he got a new hinder, I heard. Oh, yes, I did indeed, sir. I did indeed. I got the No Choil uh, uh, DLT trading exclusive uh, Warren Cliff. And also good video, too. In my jade. Oh, thank you. In the also, jade. I do love jade. I got oh, a new one myself. Look at that. Imagine my shock, That's sir. Imagine my shock. That is beautiful. Is that the wood? Is that that walnut? No, it's black G10. Black, black G10. G10. Sheep's foot. Yeah. So, I love that. Their sheep's foot is a nice looking blade, I got to say. I like yes, it is. Let me get a good there. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, so while we have you on, Skywarp, we were just talking about, uh, would would you support the idea of a, of a, of a U.S. OEM, you know, United States OEM, or, or maybe a, uh, a collective of U.S. M knife makers coming together to create some sort of an OEM situation so, uh, so designers and makers in the U.S. could mass produce or, or, or uh, produce more in greater numbers their work, uh, uh, kind of like a domestic we or, or Riyadh. You know, I, I've heard people say about that in, in the end, uh, like like Spurt had said, a co-op would be a pretty uh, pretty good idea. But um, I would love to see like um, like um, Lionel Mall or his name and uh, all the ja like all the Japanese uh, makers that make knives like Kaiser and all mm -hmm, of them. Mm -hmm. If they can make U.S. make U.S. like models with other makers, which they're doing and they're really good. Um, but I think it would, I think it would be kind of cool. Yeah. And we would, uh, we'd be able to keep that, uh, manufacturing in the United States. It would, it would actually be, a uh, probably be a good idea to, 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 <laughs> I don't know, maybe keep, you know, keep as much manufacturing here as we can. And it might be an exciting, uh, exciting project. And I think it's, uh, it could be. Uh, spirited whiskey uh, you you may ryan you may have stumbled upon like the the next uh the next iteration of of the knife world here um that's what you i know. do booze business so, <laughs> that's what, you know, i'm happy to do it for, for for whatever i love uh in this case it's it's the knife community and uh, listen i'd be happy to to help or be a part of it or you know um Shoot, I mean, I, I know the ins and outs of, of what it would probably take, costing and everything involved. So, you know, perhaps it's something I need to pursue. Yeah, uh, you might take a look at uh, Sog Knives. Uh, they've they've gone through quite a rebranding, and uh, actually, um, I, I actually have one of their one of their new knives right here, and it's it's outstanding. Um, but uh, they've gone through quite a rebranding, and uh, it's interesting to see someone come in and. And shake up a company and kind of like 
uh, you know, we got to remember where we came from and, yeah. and, and, and let's, let's shake it up. Sounds like something you, you might be good at. There's an oldie. You imagine- yeah, there's an oldie. Beautiful. Yeah. Could you imagine, like, if, if if I had the gall to do it? I probably would. I would call him right out of the blue and go go to, like, Buck and literally say, hey, Buck, I have an idea. You have the means. What if we took a portion of your business hmm. and dedicated your machining capabilities um, and so on and your production capabilities and and made a facet, a, a, a bucket, if you will, of makers to come in and, and create – larger production mid tech runs out of it that would be cool that would be cool it's kind of like how gerber is matched up with uh spartan and doing their um ever what is it called evergreen knives or i can't remember people together to do their run would, yeah i mean they could all would, make money off of it. the makers would then be able to do 500 lot productions you know yeah. in an easier way that are made here in the u.s and you would be the yenta bringing them together Right, you'd be the one bringing the the knife makers to Buck, and they, yeah, <laughs> the, I like it. The mom from uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm just thinking of the the matchmaker. Yeah, matchmaker. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I would love to see um, Rick Hinder and um, CRK join forces and make collabs or something. That'd be cool. They they'd end up uh, in a brawl. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. That I, would I bet, be cool. Yeah, I bet. You know, stuff's happening. Shirogorov and CRK. What's I that? love Shirogorov. I've always wanted Shira, one. Shirogorov Hatian, the 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 Uni Hati. Um, it's it's with Chris Reeve knives and hmm. Shirogorov. No, I I don't really? know about this. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know what? Cool. I've been living in a dark place, so, man. <laughs> Every everything you've mentioned tonight, I'm like, never heard of it. I don't know it. <laughs> That's why you bring people, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, there's a really cool um, series of customs that Shira Gorov did in collaboration with Chris Reeve Knives. I think it started at Blade Show last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they've continued to do a few here and there. Um, and the idea was they took Lisa, who is does all of CRK's incredible um, unique graphic design mm-hmm. and CGG graphic design, the computer graphic imaging that she does and the uniques and she's done a series of unique millings to put on an overlay of a um, carbon fiber side of a sheer gore of F95. That's so cool. They're, Matthew- all, they're also $2,800. <laughs> Better get to uh, Matthew Lee says, great idea, guys. I wanted to make sure I read that one out loud. He says, great idea, guys. I'll say Sweet. that again. Great idea. But uh, all jesting aside, yeah, man, uh, it, it sounds like something uh, for for which the time is. Is it right or ripe? I, I think, think it's both. R- yeah, I think you could say both. Yeah, Right and ripe. ripe I'm going to say ripe because it's more poetic. It's like a, a, a fruit just waiting to be. What are you drinking, Bob? I, I'm drinking uh, Bullet. Oh, uh, uh, great. Uh, and and actually, it's kind of funny. Um, right on my block, there's a, a guy who uh, I only ever see in the summer. I see him at, at our pool, and he's a nice guy, and we always end up talking. He always is walking around with a with a uh, with one of these, and and he is a uh, uh, a union a distiller uh, distillery union guy or uh, rep. And uh, whenever I see him with this, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that's coffee or what, what's going on in there. Anyway, we had a whiskey talk and, and I was like, I, I just like bourbon. I just like to drink it neat and I sip on it and it's lovely. Yeah. He's like, what do you drink? And I said, bullet. And he was kind of like, oh, <laughs> and I was like, all right, what, what should I be drinking? And then he like listed all these like really kick ass bourbons that I can't remember. But should we talk about the Spider Co. releases real quick? I, I would love to. I would love to. Yeah. Before before we sign off, there are there are four that in particular to me uh, that are that are crazy. But but you tell me because you just uh, put put down some money for the Swayback. Yep. So they're they're. I think the the Spider Co. Twenty Twenty lineup is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to do. Is it called the Poochie? Yeah, the the poachy. The poachy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's a big part of me that was gonna get both of them, because um, the poachy just looks like so much fun, and I think his 
Japanese design language is so cool. Yeah. And it's, a, it's just a fun way to look at, uh, at, at a hobby we enjoy, right? It's, it's a lighthearted, fun thing. And the yeah. design is cool. So that's cool. I didn't buy it, but I, I, I want to. I like that it's in a uh, CPM S45 VN, yeah. um, which is really cool. I think everybody should just, I hope everybody just upgrades from S35 that are making you know, higher tier stuff and just go to S45. So let's see if they do it. Um, but uh, the one I wound up buying is in CTS uh, XHP, which is one of my favorite user steals. It's terrific. Um, and it is the uh, the Martin Swish, uh designed Swayback. Um, and the Swayback is cool. Last week in Knife Fight, what did we talk about? We talked about slip joints versus yeah. action folders. Yeah. And here, all of a sudden, the swayback is done by <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You know what I mean? so these slip, these old slip joints that just goes right back to last week are now yeah. becoming something totally, totally new age. Um, so now he made a a really cool t- interpretation of a classic design yep. in, in a frame lock with a awesome Warney blade and CTS XHP. So I was like all in. And in, in the in the beautiful yeah. treatment, it, uh, thanks, Guy Warp. Thanks for coming on. Um, it's always great to talk to you, sir. Uh, but also you get the great treatment of the handle, like, like the, uh, it's sort of like the contoured titanium handle, like the sleeve yeah. buoy, which was also an XHP if I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and, uh, his, yeah, his designs are crazy and, and, and just kind of on, in, in line with what, in the same vein uh, of what you're saying, um, Elijah Isham came out with that super modern sway back, uh, lock yeah. back maybe last year. Yeah. I, I love that. To me, that is great because, yeah, it's taking these pleasing aesthetics and just kind of making them so it doesn't lop your finger off. I really enjoyed the last podcast. <laughs> Jim listened to the podcast at one and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get I'll get in his car. We'll go go to lunch, uh, you know, when things are normal uh, on our Wednesdays. And and uh, well, I'll get in and there'll be some podcast on at double speed. He's like, yeah picking up all this marketing knowledge at double speed. It's yeah, it's awesome. It's uh, so the uh, uh, about the pochi, the little tail thing that comes out yeah. uh, looks, uh, you know, a, it adds to the cuteness and the dog like look of the thing, but also it looks like it might fill out the hand a little bit, you know, uh, it is where your other finger goes. It's a two finger. I think it's a two finger design, and then your oh. third finger, your third finger would wrap into that because it's like a one point five six inch memory. I don't know if it's right, but just my memory for some reason remember that one point five six inch blade. And so anyway, that's a two finger, right? And so because of that, I think your third finger wraps around the tail. You would grip it like a straight razor, basically. Yeah, that's cool. Now, see, if it weren't two hundred and seventy bucks, I'd get one for my daughter because she's just about almost old enough to have her her own knife and she's really looking that'd, forward to it and awesome. that would be a, that'd be a cute one but i yeah. she loses everything so no way i'm getting that one for her <laughs> blade banter great discussion on creating a co-op oem that would be great anyone want to join us in making this come to fruition it's shameful the u.s does not have the capacity to make knives well it has some capacity but but yeah I, i'm agreeing with you it, it it feels like um you know it feels like a, a great idea Whose, whose time has come. Uh, as you may know, I'm a sucker for the Warncliffe, for the straight edge blade, especially yeah. in, in, in tactical uh, applications or imagined tactical applications. And the Yojumbo, oh my gosh. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Yojumbo. I, it's one of the few knives I have two of. And uh, this. I just like saying it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a four inch blade. That is my, yeah. my preferred you know size this is just exactly my knife <laughs> the only i have two four inch blades in um in my collection right now and i agree with you four inches is actually excellent one is another mayo mm-hmm. but this is his midnight rambler and that's a awesome four incher and the other one is uh close to four inches oh. is this uh Mar- Mar- uh Mar- custom socom compound that's beautiful it's a stone washed variant with the stingray leather inlays but i think especially if you're going to use it in in any kind of defensive situation um you're best served to have as much blade as you can (laughs) in that scenario i i god willing never have to be in that situation yeah yeah Uh, when i when i speak of it it's mostly uh 
yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's always there in the front of my mind that it could be true, but it's it's more like the fantasy thing. Okay. Have a great night. Uh, Blade Banter, good to hear from you, sir. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for conversation, Blade Banter. Yeah, thanks for joining in. Uh, I agree. Love the Warren Cliffs for self-defense applications. Me too. Now, the Canis. Have you seen the Canis, Charles and uh, Ryan? Yep. That is wicked looking. Yeah, it has a compound grind, right? Yes, it does. It, it has a compound grind, and then it has like a it has a really um, shallow flat grind. Shallow, is that the right term? A short flat grind. Uh, almost looks like a Scandi with a secondary edge. And it's got this wicked, uh, yeah, the, like a, a big old chunk on either side, uh, center swedge just for lightning. And then it, it fattens up towards the tip again. And it's got a beautifully ergonomic handle that looks like it could accommodate a number of different blade shapes really, really nicely. Yeah. Uh, never heard of the Cantus. It's called the Canis. Uh, Charles, go to... Um, Go to Knife News or go to the Spider Co. website. Uh, uh, but uh, they just released their what is it? Their fifth. It's their fifth uh, release of the year. Their fifth drop of the year. But anyway, check it out. Uh, you'll be able to see the Canis uh, as well as the Yojumbo and the Pochi and the other knives we're talking about here. The Swayback uh, that you. Ryan just put yeah. down. It looks like um, it's in CPMS 30B. It's got peel ply. Uh, the peel ply CFG 10 laminate. Give me, give me my carta on that. I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't need. First of all, I don't really like the look of carbon fiber. I do like, you know, the its qualities for uh, the grind. The 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 main, the primary grind on it looks yeah. so short. See how far away from the hole it is. It's only like halfway to the spidey hole. So that's what I'm talking about when I said shallow flat grind. It yeah. it it seems like that's for what you hope it's what. I hope it's a hollow grind. Uh, probably not. And I think that, uh, I think it said it was a flat grind, but this is for, wow. you know, this is for no nonsense, uh, uh, tactical right. applications. And yeah. so, uh, you know, you can split flesh with that and, and wow. probably breach some sort of crazy, uh, Kevlar or whatever. Yeah. Cause if you imagine it comes to a, 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 probably quite a, quite a broad triangle at the front. And, and so like, kind of like a reverse tanto would allow you to, sure. Uh, but whatever, I, I think it's just a cool looking thing, and it's it's a three seven five FYI Pochi retail map is one eighty nine two seventy. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But still, James, at one eighty nine, I'm not getting. Um, That's not well, a first knife territory. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna. I was about to call it an irresponsible, but she's not. She's as responsible as can be expected for her age. Canis looks fierce. It does. It does look fierce. Uh, that in my left hand, the Yojumbo in my right hand, and sh there's nothing I can't do. Slicey dicey, the mythical spirited whiskey. He says, "Dicey, what's up, dude? Good to see you, sir. How are you?" He's been on a tear getting some crazy sweet knives. He just uh, he just had a, a Emerson Appalachian up there, which uh, that blade stick will go away. Um, hopefully, uh, well, you know, they all take a little bit to break in, but also that beautiful purple uh, LUDT. Gorgeous. Lots of great, great stuff happening on your channel, Slicey. I love the knives you're getting. Mm-hmm. Little Mandalorian. Yeah, flip it around. Uh, I, this is the one you showed me uh, the other day, right? Or that was today. Jeez, this is the way. And then you have a matching Zippo. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's downstairs. I don't have it up here, but it's a uh, tie lighter. But Prometheus Design Works has been releasing this. This is a new thing for me. <laughs> the uh, perhaps I'm with with Prometheus Design Works Mandalorian stuff because I'm a Star Wars nut. What's a mythosaur? I am not a Star Wars. I know Slicey oh, is, and you are. You said. A mythosaur is the legendary, basically a mount that the uh, oh. Mandalorians used to ride back in their heyday to get around. They were. Like, is that the skull? That. Yeah, it's a mythosaur skull. That's their. Yeah, that's their signet. That's cool. Yeah, I I do like that. All righty, sir. Uh, I I would like to get a little knife fight in before before we wrap. Are are you? Uh, are you amenable? Let's do it. All right. So actually, I, 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 okay. You know what? We'll save. Yeah, I came up with, with another one, and Jim will wrap me on the knuckles. So we'll do that on another night. Sure. Uh, but but since we were talking about Emerson's, at some point, I would like to talk about the chisel grind. 
uh, versus the V grind. I but, like, but you know what? But yeah, I do too. That will actually be a topic of conversation and then we'll have a knife fight over it another time. But tonight it's aluminum versus titanium. Great. Uh, what would you like to, uh, what would you like to choose? And uh, I demand you go first this time. Okay. All right. Um, man, I'll, I'll, I'll take the, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a hard one for me because it, like almost all my stuff is titanium, but um, I'll, you know what? I'll make it difficult on myself actually. And I'll go aluminum. Okay, good. I'm up for a challenge here. Huh. I slapped you around last week. So, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that caliber of, uh, of competition and you, you really did quite slap me around. Plus, you know what? I was not, I, I was not convinced about friction folders. And what I, what I, what I tell my daughters is like, you have to be able to argue for any side of any story, even if even if it's a, a repugnant position, you have to be able to argue for it so you can understand it better and then argue against it. You know. Yeah. All but right. I had a hard time with the with the thing right. last week. Okay, so let's hear it. Okay, ladies and gents, welcome to Knife Fight. I am going to be talking to you about the benefits of aluminum handle material um, over titanium and why it's better. So I think it really boils down to three major talking points. The first of which is the fact that it's incredibly lightweight. It's more lightweight than titanium is. So it helps keep your weight, your weight, overall weight down. Um, so the knife remains nimble. Uh, it's not handle heavy because of that. Um, you don't need nearly the machining um, capabilities to just take out interior milling of the pockets. You know, you don't need milling pockets inside of the knife because it's lighter weight. So because of that, comes point talking point two, which is cost, right? So I think aluminum is always going to help uh, your cost. Machining costs are going to be lower. It's it's a lot easier to work with on equipment. It's still incredibly, incredibly tough stuff. Um, it also, um, it'll really do everything you need your handle to ever do in an incredibly tough manner while remaining lightweight and lower cost than titanium. Um, so I think those are a couple of the biggest ones. The third one is the fact that you can, yeah, titanium, you can flame anodize and you can um, do anodization too. Um, aluminum gives you even further ability to do color variation and uniqueness and have a, a lot of fun with the design um, as well. So lightweight cost savings, easier on equipment for knife makers, et cetera, and, uh, and ability to have fun with the design language a bit more. And it still retains incredible toughness. Well, thank you. That was uh, that was that was quite a presentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, so okay. So we're going to talk about titanium now. Titanium is a superior material uh, to aluminum, in particular, in handle design, uh, for the following reasons. Uh, and and they are not all uh, quantifiable. That is that is the problem with my argument because um, yes. Uh, aluminum is marginally lighter than titanium. Uh, the strength you get from titanium uh, is worth the weight sacrifice. Uh, the ability to uh, hollow it out, if you will, to pocket it out the backside, as you were saying, to skeletonize or scoop out pockets to lighten it uh, is there, and you can get it to the weight of aluminum uh, without sacrificing any of that uh, additional strength you get through the material. Uh, also, it is a less brittle material and also has more uh, tensile strength. Um, and, and that should be taken into consideration when, when factoring the hard use of a pocket knife. Now, the, the final factor, um, but well, I also have to say that so many knife makers have chosen titanium as the, as the, uh, the core material. You know, they changed the blade, uh, blade steels and they might change the hardware this and that but they're always uh, uh, maintaining that that titanium handle and those people have an unassailable knowledge uh, of materials uh, that go into knives that I I have a hard time questioning so I will say with the years of of people choosing titanium over aluminum uh, those those highly highly uh, sought after designers and makers there has to be some value in that but i can't add that to my argument but it must be said my last uh, the last thing i have to say is there is a 
a je ne sais quoi, if you will, uh, of titanium. There's a there's an undefinable uh, aspect to titanium that just has an appeal that aluminum can and cannot and will not ever have. Uh, aluminum just uh, has that cold hearted feel, whereas titanium has a a, a warmth that uh, is hard to quantify. Uh, ergo, titanium. Good argument. I still think I won, but <laughs> you would have, I think, won if you would have added one thing. What? That is, with, with, if you were to take aluminum over titanium and titanium titanium wasn't an option for you, uh -huh. we, we wouldn't have titanium frame locks, and that would be a game changer for everybody. Ah, so true, so true. You know, uh, you, you've got a good mind for the debate, sir. You've got a good mind for the debate. Uh, I, I would love to at some time, at some point, have you and Alex on the same show. Uh, we were almost going to do it tonight. Didn't quite work out. Uh, but I'd love to see the two of you, A, in a knife fight, and B, uh, talking knives in your in your wheelhouses, which are different from mine, uh, but different but similar uh, to one another's. You sure. know, you you have some of this, the same taste. And uh, 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 but he is a he is a lover of the knife fight as and and you are an adept. So, so there you go. Tough call, guys. Both very strong arguments. Thank you, Matthew. I I appreciate that. Uh, sure, Matthew. Even if you are just blowing smoke. <laughs> no, we both had good arguments. No, it good. is it is much appreciated. Uh, Spirited whiskey. Anything uh, anything you want to mention before we wrap? Anything coming up uh, on on your uh, feeds or in your collection that you want uh, people to take a look out for? Any anything at all a fun series that i have going on instagram um for our work in progress it's going on by razor's edge knives who oh. I know that you're a big fan of as well he does awesome josh does amazing work um and he's finishing up a incredible um -num -zan, a wilson combat specifically star tech um -num -zan build for me um it's going to be epic and there's uh, a series of pictures based on start to finish kind of and where things have gone so far. And I think the final uh, grind work and putting it together is happening tomorrow. So I'll have those coming up, which will be really, really cool. Um, I'll keep you abreast of the, what I've got coming from Matt Christensen, because that's going to be pretty, mm. uh, pretty epic as well. Um, I've got another inbound uh, Tom Mayo. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then, um, you know, besides that, you know, take a look at, at again, my Instagram feed is at spirited blades. Um, if you want to look at a lot of my knife stuff or at spirited whiskey, if you want to see a little bit more of, um, what I do and create, um, for uh, a lot of distilleries and, and what I do in the whiskey business, um, and, and spirit business. And, uh, I think that's really about it. Um, love the knife hobby, continue on by American and let's rock and roll. I look forward to the next time I have an opportunity to be on here with you, Bob. It's great. Oh man, it was a pleasure having you on, Ryan. Uh, uh, it's always great to get uh, insight from someone else uh, who has different experiences and and different tastes. And uh, man, just an awesome knife collection. I, I like that it's becoming a trend. This uh, new Mayo thing. Yeah. Uh, so. right, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes right now he's you know, and I, I don't see it going away, but he's definitely one of the favorites for sure. Um, I mean, he's legend, legend, more, legend. More of a little fun teaser. Oh God. So uh, this one is uh, another. This is another somewhat newer guy. This is Cody Utzler is his name, um, and this is his duckling. Duckling, what a beautiful blade! I mean, everything about that. The inlays, uh, double, rest... double natural micarta inlays in there. Just and restrained beauty. Limiting the the hardware points. Like, look at this side. There's no hardware on the clip. There's no <laughs> hardware coming through anywhere on this side of the knife besides the pivot. Amazing. His inlay work is seamless. So beautiful. And the boot is pretty good. So that's good too. Anyway. Beautiful, man. <laughs> I need to be better friends with Spirited Whiskey. That's funny. Yeah, man. He, the, some of that class will rub off. Alrighty, uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, us on Thursday Night Knives. It was a pleasure. Uh, please like and comment. Well, yeah, I guess you well, like and comment, subscribe, share, do all that stuff. It all it all adds up and and helps us out here. And uh, you know, I want to thank Jim, tirelessly working behind the switcher. He always does an awesome job. Jim, you and, rock, dude. 
seriously, yeah. you're, you're best in, best in show. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. And uh, you know, lets me lets me do all the bloviating, which I appreciate. All righty, guys. So uh, for Jim behind the switcher and Ryan slash Spirited Whiskey, this is Bob DeMarco saying, "Don't take dull for an answer." For sure.